um, and um, you know we're sort of general specialist in the in the field. Um, from a um, my background um, within the GBB team from a product perspective. Uh, so I'm product line with the analytics workloads. So I look after uh, data lakes, data governance, data integration, um, and those kind of things. Um, and that's that's me about my Microsoft role. So on that note, obviously the slides here are Microsoft branded, and I have a certain bias towards Microsoft products uh, just to to go to show. So full disclosure there. Um, for from a housekeeping perspective, uh, I'm OK for you to interact, uh, go off mute, ask questions. Um, if you, um, Jean, if you can help me with, um, you know, stop if there's any anyone raising hands because I can't see it. Right. But feel free to during the presentation to go off mute and uh, ask questions. Um, also, another disclosure, um, the, this is the first time I run this specific deck. Um, I think my timing is OK, uh, but I might, it might run a little bit short. So let's get going. So this session is called From Metadata to Lakehouse. Um, it is a, uh, um, a, a bit of a nostalgia session for me. Uh, it um, looks at the journey of um, data movement, ETLs, ELT, you know, data movement, pipelines, that sort of thing, and how that, that's evolved over time, and um, you know what's happening, uh, or what the sort of uh, landscape looks today, uh, and why sort of lakehouse architecture has become uh, so important. I've got a demo that's not 100% ready, but I'm going to share some of that today. Um, uh, that's based on Synapse and Synapse Spark. Um, with the metadata engine behind it. Um, by the end of the week, I will um, I will make sure that the full Git repo with everything from end to end uh, is published and available. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, Jean will uh, uh, share that uh, together with the slide deck. Um, I'm sure. Um, Cool, so let's get started. So on the agenda, I've got four talking points and then some key takeaways and Q&A. Um, so my the first uh, section I call the evolution of ETL. This is just the nostalgia piece, go through uh, you know, what's happened over time. Um, then we're gonna go through, ask the question, why Lakehouse, benefits of that. Uh, we go and look at and, and talk a little bit about what metadata uh, driven engineering is and then how you can drive scale, um, you know, uh, within the patterns and, and within the organizations that you're building from. So if we think about the evolution of, uh, of ETL, so uh, ETL was sort of birthed in, in the 70s and, uh, you know, to start off with, it was pretty much, you know, you ran batch scripts, some shell commands, you move data from A to B, um, and then you decided to load that into some other system, be it, you know, uh, mainframe, be it some database somewhere, whatever it may have been, right? Um, in uh, the sort of 2000s, we start getting good UI tools. So uh, for those of you that uh, had the, the pleasure of uh, getting to know data transformation services for SQL, that was Microsoft's first real good, uh, real sort of data movement UI tool. Um, uh, popular brand was obviously Informatica Power Center. So Informatica is a big player when it comes to, uh, to ETL frameworks and patterns. Uh, and then obviously Microsoft matured uh, with uh, uh, SSIS, and that is something that's still available today, right? Um, then all of this, or, or, or at sort of, in the late 2010s, so um, you know, with the advent advent of cloud coming into play, you know, the tool sets all of a sudden started um, uh, or needed to evolve. And uh, you know, we went from this ETL thing where we would do transformations, and we had these, uh, yeah, heavy everything was on uh, design driven uh, from a you know, all power plants were had fixed metadata. There was, you know, which caused some challenges if you want to uh, build, um, yeah, you know, frameworks that that would dynamically adopt to changing metadata. Um, so, the, 
yeah, that was one of the challenges that cloud came. The other thing that that cloud uh, or the advent of cloud brought that was challenging for the uh, behind data engineers uh, was the fact that connectivity started becoming a problem. So if you were running SSIS and you were taking data from an on-premises SQL server and you want to load it in a, a SQL VM, for instance, um, all of a sudden you had boundary, you know, bandwidth boundaries, gateways, WANs, a whole bunch of stuff that would cause problems. Connectivity wasn't 100% reliable in between and, and things started going flaky. Um, so th those kind of things started causing changes. So we need new solutions for that, right? And then people started adopting more the, the sort of the ELT uh, patterns where you'd, you know, you, you wouldn't do transformations in flight, you'd rather respect the boundaries, uh, typical one, you know, you do a copy activity and on the screen as a, you know, a data factory gen one sort of scripts, um, but you'd uh, sort of, um, move data from one place, you know, drop it in storage, uh, and then do some form of transformation there, and and then drop it in the in the next step forward, right? Um, and then if we look at today from a data engineering perspective, uh, and we look at what's getting, uh, you, you know, what's in popular and important now. So obviously. Delta Lake is hugely uh, important for us from a, um, a data storage perspective. Um, uh, yeah, Delta Lake is awesome because asset, yeah, asset-based transaction you schema exists. You get some high-level statistics, uh, able to partition data correctly or 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 easily order data, um, do sort of ANSI-style transactions by uh, by running merges and and dedupes and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, from a compute engine perspective, um, Databricks has been been a big driver for uh, the the Lakehouse architecture. Um, to, you know, they obviously come from the Apache Spark program. Uh, they started Databricks and then started building this, um, uh, you know, this, you know, Spark sort of data engineering pattern and proprietary engine for them. Um, Delta was their uh, their brainchild. And uh, now if we look at uh, Apache Iceberg, uh, that's now the Apache open source projects, you know, uh, version. There's a few other storage media as underneath like Udi and that sort of thing as well. Um, and then if we think about also what Microsoft's been doing with Synapse Analytics, um, so, you know, we, we've been trying to uh, get all data citizens under one platform. So you have data engineers, analysts, BI developers, and everyone should sort of be happy in, in one medium, right? So think about that from a framing of, uh, uh, of sort of where we come from an ETL perspective. If we then move uh, forward and we start thinking about why lake cows, you know, what, why is has Lakehouse become so important? Especially if you, you know, from a, a data engineering perspective, um, you, you know, Databricks has huge following. The whole Spark community is massive. Why Lakehouse? Well, first of all, you got to look at uh, your architectural landscapes, right? So building out architecture is hard, right? So you, you got to choose the right compute engine. You got to choose uh, the the right storage media. You got to choose the right zoning. Uh, you know, you got to choose the right uh, security models. Like it, it, it's tough, right? And then when you go, okay, well, what 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 vendors must I use, right? And you you start looking at the entire landscape, and it's it's oh, it, it's hard, right? So dealing with these things, the lake house um, uh, aims at sort of fix or, or or simplify some of these uh, challenges, right? So if we go and look at the root of where Lakehouse comes from, so Lakehouse obviously stems from uh, the data lake architectures, right? Um, and, and some of the challenges or, or if we um, if we think of uh, data lakes as a concept, they they're you know, they were really birthed out of uh, the data science needs and sort of advanced analytics needs where you needed to 
uh, do rapid prototype and, ex and experimentation. Uh, you uh, you know you you needed to be able to take a set of data, do something with it, build your experiment, and off you went. Right, um, but it brought challenges. Uh, it brought challenges because it, um, whilst there was a section of that that could be used from a data warehousing perspective, more rigid corporate sort of uh, industrialized process, the data warehousing, um, you know, uh, or, or the data lake uh, concepts were all birthed without real standards. You know, we standard there, there was con, you know, attempts of trying to get the the, the zones and the data lake standardized and the principles in between, but you, you dealt with different cohorts of users that had different methodologies and it was just hard, right? Um, Microsoft tried to solve this um, before Databricks became a, a, a big player um, in the data engineering space. And we tried to solve it with a modern data warehouse approach. You know, we had a, a cloud data warehouse, Azure SQL data, data warehouse, um, and we created this pattern where we zone off, you know, we store everything in blob, we then polybase everything into warehouse or you know, do some form of transformation with using Spark and load it in to the data warehouse. We serve it up with analysis services and then you know, off you go. This has always been a grudge pur purchase because it, it's whilst it sort of solved the scale problem, the vertical scale problem in the cloud, right? Moving to an industrial uh, industrialized pattern, it didn't solve for the masses, right? Um, and then we started in in late 2020s and, and early 2021 to move closer to um, uh, you know the lake house style architecture. We started promoting more serverless compute with Synapse Analytics, uh, Spark workloads in Synapse. Uh, we started looking at those transformative patterns that, that sort of scales nicely. Um, we, we try to move further away from uh, the modern data warehouse approach because it, in the end, it's the modern data warehouse approach is, it is a form of compromise, right? Um, and then, you know, we started moving more and more closer to the to the medallion architecture you know, we we used to uh, always name you know, raw, uh, curated, and uh, and model, and now it's more of a, a sort of bronze, silver, and gold layer, right? Principles still stay the same. So bronze is raw. Um, we it's our natural data as we ingest it. We don't transform there. It's just you know, partitioned based on 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 the dates you you deliver the data into the storage account, right? Silver, standardized in Delta uh, or or Iceberg, if you want to go down that route. Um, but you have a sim, you know, zonal principles that sort of stay the same. You know, data gets uh, gets curated in the sense that you conform it, you handle historization. Uh, deduplication, those kind of things, and then gold layer is your your you know, serving layer where uh, consumption ready artifacts are. You know, everything, all assets that are get produced there should be industrialized and hardened. Um, you should have some form of data agreements or data product agreements or or whatever may sit on top of that level. There should be SLAs associated with gold, right? So. That in in terms of the what the medallion architecture of the lake house brings, it it at least sort of takes the data lake concepts, right, and streamlines them more towards some data engineering pattern, and makes it easier to digest. It also makes it easier to create a a template, right, because you could, uh, you, you know, if we think of domain driven architecture today, look at a slide about that in a moment. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, you, you can take a sim single pattern um, and and just like cookie cut it and, and fit it to to eat to another domain or another environment, or if you need to scale it to a bigger cohort of users, you know, it, it's very, very sort of simplistic and it, it's easy to to build out. Now, if we then look at metadata-driven engineering and the in the concept of 
the the lake house right so if we look at take the lake house architecture right and then we step into the metadata driven engineering so the first question that i always asked uh, i i built my first um uh, metadata driven solution before it uh, you know I, I built it using unconventional by today's term standards right um i've, I've got a few i've got five different generations of one of these on github right that i've built out um and if you go and you search github so if you're looking for a framework right you you know in this search is like metadata etl you find 142 libraries or, or repos um and there's uh, yeah, eighty percent of all of those hits, and the, the the screenshot there is bad, but eighty percent of of the hits you get by that search is all like cloud based metadata driven frameworks for uh, Spark workloads, um, dynamic SQL workloads. It it there's like consumption ready stuff that you can just go and deploy at scale. Um, plus also, you know, um, if you look at the vendors, so. Uh, if you're working with Databricks, Databricks have um, starter guides um, for metadata driven frameworks um, as well. Um, it's something that their data engineering teams have, or, or data engineering uh, divisions have been been punting for a long time. Uh, Microsoft has that in Data Factory and Sonos pipelines. We have uh, a metadata driven framework that you can literally just like click point click and deploy. Uh, and it stands up the resources for you. So it builds out some of this uh, architecture in the background. Um, the one thing I want to say about the available frameworks and, and whichever one you pick for your data engineering project, um, what you the, the thing you should know is that there are no silver bullets and everything needs to cater for your specific use case, right? There are some basic fundamentals like how we handle logging, et cetera. But there is, um, you have to think about what's important for your use cases, right? Um, if we look at what a lake house pattern looks like in Azure, um, and uh, as I said in the beginning, I work for Microsoft, so I have uh, a bit of bias towards this. Um, a, a typical sort of um, lake house pattern will, look like this you have an orchestration engine let me get my laser pointer on so you obviously choose some form of orchestration engine so if you're in signups analytics you can choose uh, obviously the the signups pipelines or you can run adf no problem um, you have to pick uh, a way of storing your uh, metadata configuration so this is information around your pipeline so tables databases sources um business rules whatever you need to, to capture right uh, you need a way of handling uh transactional or logging so in this is uh, this pattern is based on uh on our cloud scale analytics pattern right and then you need a way of handling um real-time data as well as batch data and in this case it's it's quite simple um the real-time path is through stream analytics so it just listens to an event hub, IT hub, or whatever it may be. Um, you, you have obviously your storage accounts with your zoning. Uh, and then uh, here, you know, it's either Sun Spark, or you could, I guess, use Stream Analytics to forward load as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I like Sun Spark. Um, and, and you can just programmatically run those. And I've, I've got a, um, a a demo to to a certain degree around how this could look uh, or what this looks like. Um, this is a simple pattern. It's highly scalable. Um, you know, you your storage and your computer is completely se segregated, um, and you you have the ability to run things on demand. So, uh, you know, typical lake house architecture or lake house pattern um, says that also at the end your gold zone uh, should always be served use um, preferably using a uh, a service layer so um, if you're loading into power bi you can either connect power bi directly to the lake um, and uh, read from your delta power k files uh, in your gold layer or you could uh, materialize and serve them um, using serverless sql so wrap views around your uh, your delta delta lake tables and your gold zone. Um, 
whichever one works for you. Uh, there's always also uh, this kind of pattern supports of forward processing as well through uh, through event hubs as well. So you could, uh, you know, take your uh, your silver silver layer and and hook changes up to stream analytics and just forward load it into event hubs. Um, so typical pattern. Another thing is data management layer. Uh, and I'm going to talk, I've got a little bit of uh, a couple of slides around that in a moment. Right? So governance and uh, observability is obviously important. Cool. Um, at this point, uh, anyone want to ask any questions before I move on? You are set now. Perfect. Right. I'm not intimidating hopefully hopefully everyone that no one's worried about uh, it, any question is is a, a good question to me I, I really don't mind and full disclosure i may not know the answer uh, and i don't know everything so feel free to ask questions cool so how do we how do we then sort of drive uh, this at scale, right? Uh, or perhaps I, I can show this pattern. So let me switch. Let me just get my demo tenant up. So uh, if if we think about this pattern in particular, so um, unfortunately for this session, I didn't finish my my demo completely. But I've got, uh, like I said, by the end of uh, of this. Uh, this week I'll have uh, my GitHub repo complete uh, with all code um, and all the way down to the cold zone. So um, simple. Um, here's a simple sort of signups workspace. Um, I've got data landed in a storage account, right? Um, and uh, I might not be following best practices with this. Let me just show you anyway what it looks like. Um, I've created some form of segregation, so I've got a, a container called Lakehouse, and in there I've got a bit of a folder segregation. So I've loaded uh, some Parquet data. Uh, this is from one of our lab data sets, right? So I've landed some Parquet data uh, inside of uh, my raw zone, um, and there's just normal Parquet data here. Um, and then what I do. Uh, is I uh, have a obviously have a configuration database I read from, and um, the configuration database uh, stores the the details around those that pocket that partition pocket data that's been sliced in, right? So I have a way of uh, reading this back uh, as a lookup to get the metadata around it. So I I get the tables that are coming in. Uh, I get the uh, the partition of the uh, that I'm working with. Um, I get some, you know, some storage account details. I get container details um, and another couple of, you know, some more details in this framework. Um, also get my uh, partition keys uh, that I have. So what the desirable partition key is for my Delta table, because uh, uh, as you may or may not be aware, uh, you can partition, uh, you can uh, delta tables, so you can uh, partition them um, to speed up things when you need to manage the, the your delta lake. Um, and uh, I'm sort of passing that in here too uh, as a uh, you know as a value. So you can see that you know my city table is partitioned by country. My customer table is partitioned by the category column. Um, and you can see the date. Uh, the date table, my date uh, table here is partitioned by calendar year, etc. Right, so quite intuitive. Now, how the, this then gets read into a for each loop uh, in a pipeline in Synapse, uh, and that for each loop um, ex or, uh, runs a uh, executes another pipeline, and it passes in those values here. Uh, that was reading in from from my lookup task, right? And if we go to that child pipeline, all that child pipeline does is reads in. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it executes a um, a Spark notebook, 
and it passes in uh, the the parameters that came from uh, from that lookup activity. So it sort of runs a for each loop um, uh, on top of that, non sequential. So it will run the Spark jobs um, based on yeah. If there was more than one batch here, this was just one batch of, of six or seven tables. Uh, but if there was more than one batch of tables, um, it would have uh, run them in parallel or parallel batches. Um, and this um, uh, notebook or Spark notebook has one parameter cell, right? So here's all the variables that we're passing in. Um, and then all it does, it uh, just creates all the uh, all the logical paths and, and all of the sort of configuration setups that it needs. And then it just curses through. It runs, um, you know, loads every, you know, each, uh, each parquet partition up into a data frame. Uh, and then it uh, just writes that out depending on the partition. It, you know, if the delta tables are partition, uh, it just writes that out into delta tables and uh, and off you go. Very simplistic. So this is literally going from raw uh, to uh, to silver zone in one file swoop or one quick swoop. So uh, very simple uh, notebook uh, and a very simple process. It is effective and it works. Uh, then obviously from a uh, from an end result, uh, obviously once this is run, let me just show that everything works. Uh, oops, wrong one. There we go. So if I go to my silver, right here I'm a silver, and I'll just take one of these, select top 1000, this delta, top 100, and this contains data. There you go. So simple, simple way of, of getting started with your lake house from a sort of a metadata perspective. And like I said, by the end of the week, I'll have this fully published in GitHub. Cool. So that was the sort of the baseline architecture and what to the, from a component perspective. So moving forward, if we think about how we can drive this at scale, and there's a there's a reason I go through this this one segment because you know uh, normally I deal with um, with central teams from a technical perspective, right? So central IT uh, is trying to figure out how they can move um, uh, you know handle a business wide problem, right? And, and I'm pretty sure you deal with the same thing, right? Um, the, the 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 thing that we always come down to is talking about ownership, right? So, in in the modern buzzwords that are out there around data architecture, at least frameworks, operational frameworks for data, is things like data mesh, right? Um, uh, Jean, yeah. Couple of questions. Is it okay to read them or? Yeah, go know? for it. Go for it. Or if they want to unmute, if they're complex, happy to have a discussion. Yes. Yeah, so is there any advantage of using Spark for data movement instead of for HDF or Sanaf Spark Line? Um, so, so that's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, uh, I'm going to say this. Um, if you use, so, uh, so if you use ADF pipelines or Synapse pipelines, and, and I'm saying copy activities, a copy activity you don't do any transformations in. So copy activities literally just get from A to B. There's no transformation. Um, if you're using um, data flows in ADF, or, you know, mapping data flows in ADF or Synapse, uh, Synapse pipelines uh, or Synapse mapping data flows, uh, which is then you're using Spark in the back end. It's just how you choose to uh, to develop them. Um, the one thing I want to say is that it's easier, and, and I was a very resisting Spark for a very long time. Um, it, it was easier, it, it's easier to uh, digest the parameterization if you're using the Spark notebook. It's just from a from logically how you build it and, and how you 
uh, how you debug it. It's it's a lot easier than than using a mapping data flow. So uh, that that's that's all I'm going to say. But if you if all you're doing is copying data from one one environment to the next, right, and, and you're doing that without transformation, then a, a normal copy activity in synapse uh, synapse or or ADF is 100% usable, and it's probably the more efficient way to do it anyway. Um, if as long as there's no transformation. Yes, uh, and then uh, the uh, the question I have uh, something added, which is where does the dedicated uh, SQL pool fit uh, in the Medallion architecture? So we uh, we have a pattern. Um, we have a pet. This is a very difficult conversation. Uh, so uh, we do have a, a pattern. It, it all depends on your use case, right? So if you have um, a, a big enterprise uh, reporting, like hardened reporting environment, um, you could uh, you could you could either run um, your gold layer through um, a, a dedicated pool if you wanted to. Um, it, it kind of breaks the lake house pattern, right? It's like any, any dedicated compute that has a uh, proprietary, well, where storage and, and, and computers not fully decoupled, uh, breaks the medallion architecture. We have a few accelerators that does lake house sync. Uh, so what we do is we, you, we give you the ability to point the dedicated pool to your gold zones. Um, where there is, uh, you know, and, and you can choose which artifacts you want to uh, ingest, and we have an automatic uh, ingestion of those. So every day it goes, or or at whatever interval you'd like, uh, it goes and says, "Where's my delta? Um, load that into uh, to the next, uh, you know, the next thing, uh, or load that into my dedicated pool, into my my team, uh, my schema." So there is a uh, there is definitely a, a, a use case for uh, dedicated pools still, uh, and there will be for a very long time. Um, the one thing we gotta we gotta remember is like regulated industry um, finds that uh, you know they have certain certain they have certain requirements where uh, serverless platforms are not appropriate uh, from a compliance perspective, for instance, right? So financial services, one of those. And yeah, hopefully that that answers the question. Cool. Great. Was there an, another one? Another question? Is that uh, it? Uh, uh, you already mentioned this scenario. Um, I think uh, uh, he's completely satisfied. He just okay. died. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Uh, there's plenty of time to, for Q and A at the end. Uh, once my slides are over, and we're almost there, but five more slides, and then we're done, or eight more, apparently. Um, so, cool. If we think about domain-driven patterns, so, and this is where we're sort of sitting today in, in today's discussions, when we, we're talking to customers, um, uh, you know, federated architectures and modes of operation is, has become really important. And one of the the one thing that the lake house does for these patterns is that it at least it creates a common mode of operation right so even though you might have and this is a, a bit of a nightmare scenario uh, you have a, a fully governed mesh where everything is centrally managed so this is my utopia because it's easy to handle and this is where the you know today's pattern looks really good for Right. But you might have scenarios where you need to, um, you know, have like fully federated and fine grained ownership. So everyone owns their own platforms. You, you know, um, the the Dead Lake uh, architecture is or the Lake House architecture is really good for that. Right. And also the same thing if you got, you know, you 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 cluster domains together by, you know, whatever value chain they're aligned with or whatever um, operating domain they're aligned with, right? Um, you know, the, the, the lake house pattern does make these things simpler because it takes a very basic three three boundary layer and, and makes it easy for you to then just pick and choose. And then compute engine, that's a different story, right? Um, the other thing about 
uh, the segment. Um, it, it's always you know, data ownership, and uh, I'm sorry they're going to purview slide, but I, I, I need to talk about this. So one thing that's super important um, uh, about working in um, uh, lake house architecture or any lake based architecture is the ability to do derive lineage and ownership, right? So if you define this in purview, um, you will make your life easier, you know, because it it just it, it gives you the the idea of how how the structure you can get the structure to fit really into really easily into purview um, uh, and you can define, you know, access uh, through your control plane, your uh, your and data plane within purview and just it makes life really easy for you. It also makes it easy to determine ownership of the data so you know that the uh, engineering domain owns this one data set. You know, if, if you from a central IT or central data engineering perspective, it, it's easy for you to sort of see at least who's who's responsible and who's going to be affected by changes in the pattern. Right? The other one is, you know, it it helps you uh, establish common processes and patterns. Uh, it helps you to easily define, uh, you know, scope for policies and workflows. Right. Because whatever you do, you must remember that this is a, you know, data engineering is not a solo game. It, it's a team sport, right? And, uh, you know, if you if you think about how you're going to catalog and manage your metadata and, and how you're going to manage that from a data consumption and data ownership perspective, it's just going to help the business you're doing this for, if it's your own company, uh, if it's uh, one of your customers, um, it, it's just going to help you uh, get them to realize value from, uh, you know, uh, self-service, uh, you know, sort of self-service data democratization, and, and you know, help them drive their data literacy within. The other thing is also, I encourage you, you know, to to always practice. Uh, you know, you should always encourage and practice good data stewardship as a data engineer. Think about you know, if you can adopt uh, data stewardship as part of your operational process, as part of your, you know, as your definition of done, make sure that you've got defined data ownerships or or that, you know, you, you, you've got the right tags or, or, or at least, some, you know, some sign off process with uh, whomever was, uh, uh, you know, requesting the specific pipeline to happen or this data set to be created. Just make sure that 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 operational flow is done through good stewardship that will save you in the long term. And I, on this particular note, um, you, I have a, a an existing customer that is currently moving from one platform. They, they, it's a replatforming platforming scenario and they have a, a massive data lake environment. And they, they are at the moment trying to build out, so they, they're using Purview to build out um, uh, the lineage uh, throughout their Databricks notebooks, right? And we're talking thousands of jobs here. It's it's not a small feat. And we've discovered some, some challenges with how this platform has uh, evolved over time, um, where uh, there was a, it looks like, there was a configuration or, or a methodology change, but they, they they changed how they would use metadata and how they stored metadata, but they never changed how they the 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 spirit or the patterns of the original platform. So at the original platform pieces, some of them have become polluted. So it's it's impossible at this point in time, or it's super hard. For for some of the pipelines to determine lineage because it just it it, it is it, it's a mess. Um, no one's detected that this has changed, but it because it they were consistently wrong, so everyone sort of accepted that this is just how it is. Um, so yeah, it's a strange scenario, but it's super important that that data stewardship, especially when you're working with lake-based pattern like uh, like a lake house. Right? Um, and the other thing is, you know, 
leverage the native tool sets, like leverage tools like Purview. Uh, if you're in Databricks, make and you've done gone to Unity or you Unity enabled your workspaces, you're running premium workspaces in in Databricks. Uh, make sure that you know you you keep your Unity catalog health healthy. But uh, uh, you know from a data governance perspective, as long you you need to have a lineage map. You need because in the end, you need to make a change. Uh, you need to be able to understand what the upstream and downstream um, uh, sort of impacts are, both from a, a data products perspective, um, but and also from a business perspective. And uh, it's especially important understand doing impact analysis today and having already built tooling or built the the tooling into the uh, into your workflow because unlike in the legacy environments when we were running with SSIS where everything was pretty much documented you know if you work with Informatica uh, power center everything is documented because you hard coded your ETLs so that will never change you always understand the impact of your change in uh, in lake based patterns and especially when you're running metadata driven patterns you you know because they can scale so rapidly it, lineage is super important cool so to close off uh, i've got three takeaways from you um metadata uh, driven engineering provides a, a, a sort of a, a clear data boundary or, or provides for clear data boundaries at scale so think about it it's configuration Right, you're using uh, if you're using Lakehouse patterns, uh, they're like uh, scalable, long-term, supportable concepts. And I want to stress this fact, especially when we're talking about the compute and the workloads. Um, uh, the Lakehouse pattern uh, really doesn't care what your compute node is or, or how you what you're using to uh, uh, to process the data with. Uh, today, Spark is super popular. Uh, and Spark workloads um, in the future, God knows what it's going to be, right? Um, so the pattern itself is long-term supportable um, because we yes, compute and storage segregated. Um, and then the last takeaway is around data engineering and data governance. It's a team sport. Everyone must do it. You must practice it as well as the business user and their stewards. Cool. And with that. Um, Open discussion, questions, um, anything? Yes, I have a couple of questions for you, but uh, before I go over the question, I'd like to say thank you. That was outstanding. Cool. My uh, pleasure. Uh, yep. Um, I think St uh, Stefan already responded to one of them, but uh, let me go and revisit uh, some of them with you. The question is, can Purview and Calibra uh, be used together? Of course, um, and I'll give you a use case. Uh, I, I, have, uh, uh, I have customers that are um, using multiple, so regulated industry, right? Uh, financial, big, big, big financial sector, customer um, with uh, Swiss headquarters. Um, they have from a regulatory compliance, they actually use Calibra for uh, for a certain central artifacts or central governance processes, right? Um, but then what we've done is they, for the data platform and the regular domain management and and, and the, the regular data, uh, data governance, um, we use Purview. So every we use the the native connectors, we use the the Atlas endpoints, we use all the the REST connectors to to um, uh, to sort of harvest and maintain the data from a data domains perspective. We use the meta models, uh, but then we have uh, processes that are on a daily basis. If it detects things that need to be published to the Calibra catalog and they've got certain tags to look for, we automatically just push that up, and then we have a down. Uh, a, a reverse sync as well uh, to pull that back in. So yes, they can work together. Great, thank you. Um, the other question is that they said uh, at what stage? Oh, give me one second. There's one new. Uh, at what? 
on okay at what stage of lake house project and who productions of purview is suggested when it comes to lake house where where do you think of purview is suggested what stage um from a lake house architecture so purview is is suggested at all stages uh, and um, so think of it this way um from a data governance perspective the biggest challenges you will have is determining ownership right ownership of data and that goes from technical data in your raw your bronze zones right because you need to know that it exists right you need to understand the lineage not from a consumption perspective but from a technical perspective so if you're making a change it's important to understand the lineage what your downstream process yeah you know, what downstream processes are affected so all the, from bronze all the way to gold the difference between um bronze and gold is just how it's visible uh within purview um i whenever i speak to a, um an organization uh, around publishing uh, like a um like a data, uh, not a data catalog, like a marketplace catalog. We're using Purview as a as a data marketplace or a searchable marketplace. Um, I talk to them and I say, you know, once data is processed in gold and industrialized, you can take a, a you can create a published uh, subset of that 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 you now sharing or that's SLA from you, and you can move that as part of your curation process from your gold collection to your uh, within purview to your published gold collection um which is fully searchable and indexed so that um that the the data consumers you know can have a good experience and be able to just search for something and it's always then you always get the right published product so uh, to sh the short answer is uh, all stages of your lake house uh, all lake house zones all your data zones are affected and i would say that probably also your at, at some point in time, your your on-prem data sources or your other sources are also uh, should also be covered by uh, by Purview. Outstanding. I have cool. uh, another question for you, uh, Eben. He said, uh, for example, could you please share your experience on the query performance comparison between running the same query against Lake House? versus warning the query against with us, you know, data warehouse. Okay, so um, that is a bit of a moving target at the moment. So um, I, I, I'm i gonna say, so if you're running Synapse dedicated pools, right? As a data, uh, as a as a data warehouse, is a great MPP engine, right? It is. Um, it, it has really good performance, and you know, it, it it's a world class engine. Yeah, you know, millisecond response time, all is good. Um, if you look at um, uh, running. Uh, uh, running a, a serverless engine on top of your your delta tables. Currently, Databricks has a good uh, DB SQL offering uh, that's really performant. Uh, they've they've got that in public preview at the moment, um, where they do a little bit of magic uh, with with caching and that. And that, from a direct query perspective, that is uh, quite performant. So. Data, uh, Azure Databricks with uh, DB SQL is good. It's a good serverless uh, option. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say this, you know, it, dedicated pool or traditional cloud data warehouse performance and the serverless concepts or serverless wrappers, they are starting to, they're starting to blend or, or, or the, the gap between them are, is shrinking. And there's a, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, there's a, there's quite a lot of things happening at the moment, and um, for interesting announcements around analytics and what's happening in the future, I would recommend that you you register for build and 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 take part in that. It, it is 
Um, there are some uh, some really interesting announcements coming there. Uh, that GitHub library is my old GitHub library. It's not the one uh, where I'm going to be publishing. Th there are some stuff there. You, you, you can uh, thanks for publishing that or putting that link through. Uh, my new GitHub is <laughs> no worries. Uh, my my more cleaner GitHub where I'm going to be publishing this code is. Hopefully I don't share anything. There we go. This one. I'll paste it in the chat. Cool. All right, but uh, good shout out. Thanks for that. Cool. Um, right. Um, I see there's another. Sorry, first of all, Eben, uh, are you good with that answer? Um, you happy with that? Cool, awesome. Uh, in terms of the next question, so could you integrate Azure Cogni, uh, a Cognitive Search into um, uh, the lake house? So sure, um, if you... Um, I'm not a, a, an AI kind of guy, or, or well, I, I I belong to that business unit, but I'm not specializing in AI. Um, if you if you sorry, I have a wasp flying through here. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry about this. I'm looking around. Um, I, I can, you could obviously use cognitive search. Um, uh, I'm sure that would uh, I'm sure there would be a use case for it. Um, I just can't think of the use case at the moment. Uh, Mike, is that, are you good with that? Cool. Right. Any other questions? Outstanding. I think we went over all the questions. Um, seeing if you have no more questions, uh, we'll be happy to end the meeting, but if you do, you can quickly come up mute, okay? And type your question. By the way, we are getting some great feedback, Andreas. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Carry on. Yeah, so I just want to say I see a question around uh, the slide deck. Yes, uh, I will definitely share the slide deck. Jean, uh, you got obviously on the uh, through your through the forum, you have a way of sharing PDFs, right? Yes. Cool. So I'll I'll share that with you and you can distribute that through the user group. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andreas. That was outstanding. Cool. Awesome.